Thank you again to the State Library uh, for hosting Frame Documentary in this our first year. Um, this iteration of Frame Documentary would not have been possible without the support of the Victorian Government through Creative Victoria, Fix Screen, and of course Start Space, powered by the State Library. Um, my name's Yana. I'm one of the directors of Frame Documentary, and a key part of our program is our annual acceleration program for non-fiction creators working at the intersection of art and technology. And our first cohort of creatives have just spent the weekend here at Start Space working alongside David Oppenheim and Karim Ben Khalifa as they develop their interactive projects. And now it's your turn to spend some time with David and Karim. So following a presentation from each of them, we're going to make some time for a Q&A afterwards. And I really look forward to the conversation that their presentations um, provoke in the room. So David, David is a creative producer and executive producer of interactive experiences at the National Film Board of Canada. His most recent credits included Draw Me Close, Agents, The Book of Distance. Am I stealing your thunder, David? <laughs> um, uh, Book of Distance, Otherly, The Space We Hold and To Kill a Tiger. Um, his productions have won multiple Webby Awards, Canadian Screen Awards, and a Peabody Facebook Futures of Media Award and have premiered at major festivals including Venice, Tribeca, Sundance and TIFF. David's participation in Frame Documentary has been made possible through the support of the Government of Canada in Australia. And while the councillor was unable to send a representative um, to be here this evening, they did want to pass on a few words. So COVID has showed us, and especially Melburnians, just how powerful the role of technology can be to our humanity and our ability to stay connected. Immersive and emergent technologies open new doors of opportunity. They can expand, enlighten, and delight in this brave new world. Frame provides a vehicle to nurture innovation at the vanguard of art and science. And we, the Government of Canada and Australia, are pleased to have David involved and to partner with emerging creatives from Victoria. So with no further ado, I give you David. Thanks for having me. Uh, thanks to the State Library uh, and to Frame Doc. I see some Frame Dockers uh, here. Um, you guys have a treasure of a State Library. Very jealous. We have a good public library system in Toronto, but this is uh, beyond. So, uh, yeah, I'm jealous. But um, quick before I start is uh, the Frame Dockers who are here. I know you don't have to participate, but how many people have um, tried or been a uh, participant in an interactive narrative experience? Do you want to just raise your hand? Whoa. Okay, great. VR, virtual reality, mixed reality. Okay. Okay, great. Um, It was built in Flash, but this is an amazing animated interactive uh, story by Vincent Morissette and the National Film Board. Um, but I put it uh, here because it just seemed to go with, with sort of the first thing that I want to say, which is um, addressing the question of this, um, of this talk, which I just think is sort of inescapable at the moment, um, is that we're, we're hopelessly technological animals. Um, so the question for me is uh, less can technology make us human, um, but how can we use our tools and technology or tools slash technology to locate and learn about the most uh, human elements of ourselves? And so I want to talk about this, but through the lens of a, of a maker. So my journey in the field started in 2001 when I did a six month residency at the Canadian Film, Film Center's new media lab. When I left the lab, I mostly worked uh, in uh, current affairs television and documentary film as a story researcher, news producer, director, and writer. Uh, I did some experimentation with interactive uh, storytelling on the side, 
but it wasn't until 2007 that I co-created my first interactive documentary. For the last 17 years, I've been working on interactive narrative uh, productions as an experienced designer, a story editor, um, but mostly as a creative producer. Uh, and formerly, uh, well, for the last eight years of those 17 at the National Film Board of Canada. Um, creative producer for me, uh, just to give you some context from where I'm going to talk from, uh, serves uh, is, is a position that serves as the, the key creative collaborator uh, of the artist that is at the center of the work, um, but also, uh, for me, the voice of the participant, sometimes called the user in interactive storytelling, uh, but I prefer participant. Um, and I want to share a small sample of work that I've done, uh, uh, not just to show you the work, but to uh, share with you how I think about audience um, and how I, as a creator of interactive stories, um, see you formerly an audience and now participants uh, who are navigating the worlds that we build. Uh, in other words, um, and in addition to that, uh, I want to talk and show you these projects in terms of how our teams use technology to locate the most human elements of ourselves, uh, to um, also locate the most human elements uh, of us as makers, but also of uh, the audience as participants. So the first thing I want to say is, yeah, there's a number one there, I just realized, but um, is artists and makers aren't creating in a vacuum. Uh, and we as a society are not consuming art or any form of media in a vacuum. Uh, the technological tools that we use every day uh, for any number of tasks uh, aren't blank objects uh, that exist independently of economic uh, labor and political systems. So to add to the question that I started with, I think the question for me that we want to think about in terms of can technology make us humans is more so uh, how can we become more human within a system that uses technology and technology platforms uh, and other layers of technocratic systems uh, to, to accumulate power and massive wealth for, for just a few individuals, uh, relatively speaking, in society. And I don't think any discussion of whether technology can uh, make us human or is what makes us human should be had without recognize, uh, recognizing the, the ocean that we're swimming in. Um, and to use virtual reality as an example, um, this is one layer uh, of that ocean. Um, and we can add Apple to the list. Uh, in June of this year, reportedly, they're going to release their much-awaited mixed reality uh, headset. Some of you may have seen this photo. There were lots of memes made of it, but it's uh, what immediately came to mind when uh, I was asked to speak about the subject of can technology make us human. But I want to say that, uh, you know, on the plus side for creators, Facebook, now named Meta, um, has pushed VR uh, hardware forward significantly. Um, but we should remember why, uh, which is, I mean, simply that at the end of the day, uh, they are a uh, advertising company, probably trying to be something else in the future, um, but they're beholden to a, a bottom line. Um, there are plenty of critiques of social media, and I'm not going to go into them in terms of what social media has uh, done along with us to our society. But my point here is that technology, in this case, the technology that enables us to experience virtual worlds, uh, is part of a larger system um, that we should think uh, about and be aware of as makers and as uh, audience. So technology can be used to tell stories. It can be used to create art uh, and to communicate in ways that make us more human. But it can easily be used to dehumanize us. Um, it may be a bit small, but this is from a, a brilliant artist uh, based in Montreal, uh, uh, called Green uh, Jibula, and it's called Housewarming, her exhibit 2022. Um, so it, in this case, it's important to point out that it's not just the technology on it, on its own. So, you know, it's not just the cameras uh, that are used to monitor how long it takes a worker to do a certain task. Um, it's the entire hard and soft infrastructure that the camera sits within. So, for example, 
uh, the social uh, layer, so groomed expectations of instant delivery, uh, the economic layer, uh, in this case, uh, you know, a host of factors that lead to uh, precarious piecework, uh, a legal layer, union busting, labor contracts, and a material layer, the, the pods that workers are, are placed inside. So when we think of monitoring or any piece of technology or tool, um, it's helpful to think uh, in terms of, of layers. So the ideas of looking at technology, specifically computational technology, as more than just a machine, but as global infrastructure, is helpful for thinking about the implications of our tools, um, most of which are computational in some form or another. So uh, this is a reference um, uh, for more for you to look up later, um, but because I'm in the midst of looking it up. It's a book by Benjamin Bratton uh, called The Stack on Software and Sovereignty. And uh, it's a book that just came to my attention in the last few months while taking a critical theory course uh, as part of a, a, a late life stage uh, master's degree. And um, it just reframed so much of what I see. Uh, and now I can't see anything differently. So basically, and I, I'm just going to keep it brief because I wouldn't do it justice. Look up Benjamin Bratton. He, he thinks about this for a living. But the way that I understand it and, and, um, is that he looks at uh, the world and tools uh, as, as layers. So uh, different types of computation, whether it's smart grids, smart cars, mobile apps, or smart cities, uh, should be seen not as individual applications or systems, but a coherent whole. And as he says in the talk, uh, they should be seen as an accidental uh, a megastructure called the stack that is both computational uh, in terms of apparatus and a new governing architecture. And then he goes on to say that we are uh, in it and it is in us. So the whole idea of loops. Um, and VR is no exception. The hardware and software is part of a much larger human and technical, uh, technical system. When virtual reality, uh, while it could become a powerful tool uh, for self-knowledge, and I hope that's what it becomes, uh, as any uh, great, uh, as any medium of which great art is made, um, it could become uh, other things. It could evolve into other things entirely. Um, this is an image um, from probably 1985 or so, Jerome Lanier founded VPL Research, uh, one of the first, if not the first, company to sell VR headsets uh, and haptic gloves. And in his book, Dawn of the New Everything, which I recommend, um, Encounters with Reality and Virtual Reality, uh, he puts forward multiple definitions of VR uh, as, a, as a way to better understand the medium. So there's, he doesn't try one definition, I think there's 40, and the, most of them are, are relatively short. Uh, his fifth definition is VR is a mirror image of a person's sensory and motor organs, or if you like, an inversion of a person. Um, in other words, a powerful tool for self-knowledge. Uh, but then his 13th definition, and I don't know if he believes in bad luck in 13, but the 13th definition is the perfect tool for the perfect, uh, the perfect tool for the perfect, perfectly evil Skinner box. Uh, so there's that, which is a good reminder uh, that while we should dream, we should also be really clear-eyed as uh, makers when looking at the technologies and tools that we use, but also as a society uh, for various tasks that we use these tools. And, you know, VR is a powerful medium. Uh, you can have powerful and affecting experiences in it, and I've had set a, a few, uh, a lot of not powerful and accept, uh, affecting experience, but a few, and they're different, but um, they're different from, but unlike, for example, the power of a book. So for me, I think we need to learn what VR is good at, and that's what I've spent the past uh, six or seven years doing, and prior to that, um, 15 with other interactive uh, mediums. So we want to look at what it's good at in terms of how we can leverage it, its affordances. So. The flat surface on the right affords pushing. The handle uh, on the right uh, affords uh, pulling. 
uh, a book is um, good for creating vivid and, and powerful worlds inside our minds, and it's good for communicating information. And I'd say that VR is good for immersing our bodies in any world that we can imagine and giving us the power to affect that world. But I think that to turn VR into a powerful uh, storytelling medium, into a communication medium that leverages its affordances um, in terms of what it, finding what it means to be human, um, we need to find ways to get that technology into the hands of more and more diverse uh, artists and makers. Uh, and critical makers. And we need to fight against uh, the gravitational force of what uh, the economic uh, structures and distribution, corporate distribution uh, platforms demand from us. Uh, of course, we as makers, we as a society need to fight for technological uh, uh, transparency, for data transparency, for ethical frameworks of um, ownership of data, um, and ethical legal frameworks and moral frameworks that govern how corporate and uh, corporate powers and governments use uh, the technology. And I'd say uh, that sometimes we just need to put down the tools. So um, I was looking for Vive Focus uh, one day, Vive Flow, and it's maybe too small to read, but Vive Flow, mindfulness with immersive VR glasses, um, you know, sure. I, I guess, uh, but you know, you could also just go outside and, and be mindful. Um, so I'd like to shift, uh, and talk about a few examples of interactive narrative experiences that I've worked on that I believe, uh, make us more human. We, we tried to, to do that anyway. Um, and then also give you, uh, leave you with a few thoughts, uh, uh for, for you as audience, uh, you as participants. Uh, in terms of how, how, how to find your place in those stories. Um, and maybe those of you who have played a lot with interactive stories might be old hat, but maybe uh, for, for some of you who haven't, it might be, um, it might be interesting. <laughs> so uh, before I show you a couple of those projects, I just want to frame how I see um, the medium in which I've been working. And uh, the creative interpretation of actuality is uh, my favorite definition of documentary. Uh, it's fundamental to the work that I do and how I see the work um, and the medium. And it's fundamental because I think it's different from more prescriptive definitions of, of documentary. And I kind of think it's probably a pretty decent uh, definition for creating art in general. Um, So when I start off and I'm thinking about uh, creating uh, with a team something, uh, telling a story, creating an interactive experience, the, the main question that I ask is, broadly speaking, why is it interactive? Uh, why is it not a film or a, a book? And uh, let's say with a film, if, if a film, we can uh, agree to call it uh, a representation of the world, then the question that I think we should ask with interactive storytelling is how does that representation change if people are actively involved uh, in uh, creating the experience uh, or in, in changing the experience? Or to put it another way, does it find uh, a way for the user to construct an experience reality? Uh, or a very readable master's thesis, by the way, if you're interested. Um, so this is how I see you this is how I see you formally as the audience, uh, now as participants at the center um, of the story, as uh, people with agency um, in the creation of your experience, uh, in the telling of your own story um, that our team has designed for you. This is a good, um, a good definition of agency uh, by Janet Murray in her book Hamlet on the Holodeck, highly recommend as well. The satisfying power to take meaningful action and see the results of our decisions and choices. Um, this is another way of, of, of sort of looking at it. Um, true character is revealed in the choices a human being makes under pressure. The greater the pressure, the deeper the revelation, the truer the choice to the character's essential nature. And Robert McKee is a well-known script editor 
writer, teacher. Um, and he was talking about the medium of film when he said this, but I, I think it's also true of the best interactive experiences uh, of interactive storytelling in general, with the key difference being, of course, that um, the character is you, uh, the participant. So my goal with any interactive experience that I'm involved in, in creating is for the participants of the work to walk away uh, feeling that the actions they took uh, reveal something about themselves uh, when, they, when they leave. Will Wright, the creator of uh, SimCity and Spore, uh, people talk about how games don't have the emotional impact of movies. I think they do, they just have a different palette. I never felt pride or guilt watching a movie. Um, the idea of affordances uh, underlies what Will Wright is saying here. Uh, the affordances of video games are what allow designers, writers and directors uh, to engender emotions like pride or guilt. And I think the same goes for what you can do as a creator of an interactive uh, story experience. So I'm gonna show you a couple of projects now, um, show you a couple of trailers. Um, but uh, before I show you some of the work that I was part of creating, uh, I want to introduce you to the work of Char Davies, who is a true pioneer in uh, virtual reality storytelling. Uh, I learned about uh, Char Davies while I was doing that uh, six month residency that I mentioned, uh, in, uh, 2001, and I still haven't managed to experience her work, uh, which will become clear in, uh, in a little bit. So in the late eighties, Davies, uh, co-founded the software company, Soft Image, um, coming out of Danielle Langlois' work at the National Film Board. Uh, the company's first product, Soft Image 3D, was used in the creation of special effects uh, for movies such as Jurassic Park uh, and Titanic, which I still haven't seen. Um, so Davies left Soft Image after it was acquired by Microsoft. Uh, she talks about wanting to get back to creating art. Um, she started her working life and career as a painter and uh, quite a, an amazing painter. Um, in 1995, she released Osmos. So that explains uh, why I haven't seen it, because if you missed it then, a couple of years later, uh, it, it would have had to be rebuilt for, you know, different technology. Um, and it was also quite involved. So it was shown, but it was hard to see. Um, so Davies talks about Osmos as a space for exploring the perceptual interplay between self and world, a place for facilitating awareness of one's own self as consciousness embodied in a developing space. Sorry, an enveloping space makes more sense. Um, in a, two th a 2017 interview with a Berlin-based contemporary art magazine, she said of her early explorations, I wanted to prove that this new spatial temporal medium was capable of enabling experiences that could reaffirm our embodied being in the world rather than distracting and distancing uh, us from it. So this is about a minute and a half, but it uh, shows it shows a remounting of the 1995 work uh, in last year. Um,
really trying to bring those works to uh, Toronto. So if anyone wants to help or Australia, State Library would be great for this. So uh, I'll just, because I think it's uh, really relevant to people in the rooms and, and certainly some people I know who love her work and want to experience it, I'll just read. Um, of Osmos, Davies said, uh, Osmos became known worldwide for its astonishing effect on many who experienced it. My belief is that the effect is due to being immersed in a virtual realm that is unlike our habitual perceptions, whereby because of the interface reliance on breathing and balance and our semi-transparent visuals, uh, immersants can float as if gravity free, as well as see through and pass through everything around them. This creates a perceptual shift as attention is redirected away from interacting with a world of things to an awareness of their own embodiment in enveloping space and time. This often creates a sense of wonder and can be deeply emotional. So her work uh, serves as an inspiration and it has since 2001, which is pretty amazing uh, given I've never experienced it. But I just want to um, show two productions I've worked on as a creative producer that really tried to use technology in the service of storytelling, uh, more precisely to build a world where uh, the audience was placed at the center and was given agency uh, to become an active participant who moved through the world to create their own story. So Draw Me Close was a co-production between the film board and the National Theatre. Uh, it was a theatrical experience for one person at a time uh, that uh, combined uh, live performance with animation and VR. This is a bird's eye view of the stage where you experience it. Uh, and this is a trailer uh, for the experience in uh, when it was a work in progress. Uh, the marketing team just went went crazy for the uh, Whoopi Goldberg quote, but I I like this much better. Um, so this was audience reaction uh, captured by the backstage team uh, when audience members removed the headset, and uh, not just because they wrote it the biggest, but I loved uh, VR can have a heart. Um, and just uh, two images that I think capture the mix of the kind of hard technology and the soft human inherent in the work uh, are this one and this one. So last uh, piece I want to show you uh, just before leaving you with a few final thoughts 
is what we called a dynamic film that was co-created by our team of humans uh, with reinforcement learning uh, artificial intelligent agents. And this is just a quick one minute trailer. So although agents, uh, if you try it, maybe as you saw in the trailer, although it doesn't seem really written in the, in the way we understand writing uh, as in a film or a novel, uh, it's, an, it, it's an example of, of using algorithms uh, wrapped in a story structure. So I, I just want to walk you through the story st structure really quickly. Um, once upon a time... Uh, five artificially intelligent creatures called the Agents lived on a small, rotating planet, struggling to survive. These creatures face an ongoing physical dilemma. The planet has strange gravity. If the Agents get too close to the edge, they may spin the planet and fall off into infinity. infinity. And every day, the Agents must cooperate, learning how to keep their environment in balance in order to survive. Until one day... You arrive, the participant, with the power to plant a seed on their planet. And as a result, stuff happens. Uh, this is classic kind of story structure. And then over the course of five to ten minutes that the experience takes, a chain reaction initiated by you uh, arcs through entropy and the environment returns to a state of balance. Uh, after which the experience begins, you float down in front of another planet with agents. And the participant, we hope, is brought through uh, a journey of change, both for the virtual planet um, and its inhabitants, uh, the reinforcement learning AI agents, and hopefully uh, within themselves. So that's it for the work. Um, I'll leave you with a few final thoughts, but listening to me talk about this kind of stuff and watching trailers is just like the worst facts or facsimile uh, so, um, draw me close. We hope to remount agents. Uh, if you have access to VR headset, maybe if the state library has some, uh, you can get it at these places, but it's also available for tablets and PCs on steam. So, um, just finally last, uh, minute or so is bringing back this image kind of seemed fitting to me uh, to finish my talk with uh, a few suggestions for how to approach this kind of storytelling uh, as an audience member. Uh, not a, a passive audience member listening to the radio or uh, watching a movie at the cinema, um, but an active participant with agency to co-create your experience inside the world that's given to you. So we know how to go to a movie um, because those rituals have been uh, developed over time and we know them well. But just a couple thoughts on approaching VR or any interactive work as a participant. Um, hopefully for makers uh, in the room, you can uh, kind of flip these uh, and they might serve as design advice. So uh, first is uh, just to seek out art, which, which may sound uh, kind of obvious. Um, but basically look past the popular on Netflix, Netflix kind of cue, which for VR would be looking past Facebook or Meta's um, Quest Store, where you uh, get your VR experiences. Um, and by looking past, you look past the, the gatekeepers who decide what is marketed and what is put on the front page. And they decide based on a fairly narrow set of criteria um, and on their bottom line. So... 
uh, look past that, go to more open online stores like Steam. It has its own problems, but it's more open. Uh, go to festivals, galleries, um, and art school exhibitions and try to find uh, experiences that use emerging technology. Um, the second is when you put on a VR headset, especially for those that haven't, is uh, just simply to move, to try things. Uh, you can't break anything. Um, move your body, see what happens. Push a button, see what happens. Don't be afraid to break things or ruin the experience by doing something wrong. And then uh, the other one is just to shed the world or the outside world um, and take a bit of time to shift into a virtual space. Even if it's not a part of the designed experience, um, do the equivalent of buying popcorn, um, choosing your seat, turning off your devices, uh, other than the device that you're wearing on your face, of course. And the final piece of advice is to look out for the stack, which is back to just that Benjamin Bratton idea, which um, excites me a lot. And I hope some of you look it up because I don't think that you will see technology or tools the same. So if you go through uh, a, an experience narrative or otherwise that uses technology and the stack or the complexity of uh, the world, uh, which is kind of undergirded by power structures at all times. Uh, if that's not part of the POV of the piece, then I just encourage you uh, to look for it because I think it'll make your experience richer. So thanks for listening and I, I look forward to the conversation after. Thank you, David. I saw some people taking notes, which is great. Look forward to the questions. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Karim Bel, uh, Ben Khalifa. Uh, Karim is an award-winning Belgian-Tunisian trans disciplinary artist and director whose documentary storytelling is at the crossroads of art, science and technology. A proponent of cross-pollinisation that spans disciplines, he has anchored his practice in non-fiction narratives. Um, Karim, are you going to go through your background or your history, or I can uh, do that now? Yeah, just yeah. a bit. Just a bit. I, I, I want to thank, to start with, um, I want to thank the State Victoria University. I want to thank the Frame team who allowed us this weekend to work with Dove Fellows, and I want to thank them too. We had really a great time. Um, I live in Berlin, so I just came specially for this. I'm really happy to be speaking to you. And thank you, David, because you said so many things I don't need to say anymore. So, um, can technology make us human? I think we should look at this a bit differently. We make technologies. Um, technologies doesn't make us human. Eventually, once we make them, they're going to influence us. Um, I'm a maker. I need to tell you that I've been a war correspondent for 18 years. I was a photographer, so I was not working with high-end technologies. Um, what always has interested me, though, was the human aspects and why are people fighting? Why do they kill each other? I'm a storyteller, and along the way, I realized that um, it's a storytelling that divides the people also. So when it comes to technology, I thought I wanted to start with a quote from Noam Chomsky which clearly tell us that technology is agnostic. It depends on the people and what they do. You can build a library with a hammer, a bit more than a hammer. And you can probably destroy your library with a hammer. It would take some time or so. But those are only tools. And perhaps I would like to add, but that's a subject I'm not really good at, that there is one technology that doesn't belong to that. It's AI, uh, because we feed AI, and we feed it with our own bias and your own stereotypes. And obviously, if it's reproducing something, it will reproduce that too. So that is something to be very mindful of. Um, as a war correspondent, I was going from one side to the other. And in order to go very quickly to tell you about my project that I did a few years ago, 
Um, I'm going to just put the trailer, and that's going to go faster than what I could tell you. Wow. Get too close to really phenomenal. The enemy was born out of my frustration as a photojournalist and war correspondent. For almost 20 years, I have photographed conflicts and witnessed the consequences of huge geopolitical shifts. When I became a father, I simply knew I could not keep working on the front lines. Yet, I was not done trying to understand wars. Oh, me na ba uwa kaju na buba na ni uwa. My friends in Israel, when they know I'm heading for Gaza can't help themselves but to wish me luck and to stay safe. They believe a lot of people in Gaza are irrational. Also, when I spend weeks working in Gaza and I'm about to return to Israel, my Palestinian friends are telling me the exact same thing. Be careful there. The project is rooted in my experience as a war photographer going from one side of the front line to the other and finding that the fighters' dreams, hopes, and nightmares are often more similar than they are different. So there is a bigger story than the war itself, and this is the one I want to explore and share. For the enemy, I am using the latest technologies in virtual and augmented realities so you can engage directly with the combatants and meet them, hear them, and feel them the way I did. In many parts of our worlds, you create an enemy as a kid without having met your enemy because the society around you has created an enemy in the other. So the question is, could I be you if I was on the other side? So the enemy is a 300 meter square installation with 20 users at the same time. They meet fighters that I met myself in Congo, in El Salvador, in Gaza, and in Israel. I'm asking the same set of questions to those fighters. And questions are very simple. Who's your enemy? Why did you ever kill him? What is violence for you? What is peace to you? And where do you see yourself in 20 years from now? Those questions are very simple, yet they reveal a lot. But the first question, as a matter of fact, we won't learn much because we know who's the enemy of whom most of the time. But when we ask them what is peace or what is violence or where they see themselves in 20 years from now, their answers are similar. They're saying the same thing. And this is what I've seen as a photojournalist going from one side to the other. But it's also something I could not translate with photograph. So I had the chance to be invited at MIT as an artist in residence. And this is where I discovered virtual reality. And this is where I thought, perhaps, if it's a medium, I'm going to be able, finally, to tell that story. And it's not the story of differences, it's the story of commonality. Obviously, you understand, I'm very much on the humanist side. And I've seen people from all over the world, and there is always this element of human in them, taking care of the children, trying for them to have a better life. But then the storytelling comes in the way. And sometimes it's justified. There is violences. We should not deny them. But if we think about reconciliation, and war is about dehumanization, if we think about reconciliation, 
we need to find a way to rehumanize. And for me, this work was very much about that. So technology, for me, in this sense, can make us a bit more human. Just because we meet the person from the other side, the person we don't really want to meet, but we eventually listening to him and discovering commonality with ourselves. And this is what I was really trying to do with the enemy. Um, I want to show you maybe in the trailer, you can see a bit of what it looks like inside, but you are at some point in between two human beings and you're going to have to make a choice and listening to them. So I'm just going to quickly run you through a short example of funny days. What is your name? How old are you? What is your rank in your arm group? My name is Passion Kaboy. I'm a soldier and I hold the rank of sergeant. I entered the Congolese government army in 2002 and I'm now 30 years old. Passion, who's your enemy? My enemies are the Mai Mai of the NDC and the FDLR. They're the ones who came to threaten me in Congo. They threaten the population. Just to give you an example, um, those people exist. I went there, I filmed them with multiple cameras around. It was interesting when I started the project, people said, but how are you going to go there? Says this is the simple part, everything else will be complicated to put that into an experience. And um, there was one element that, as I was doing this, I realized it's if you turn the page of a magazine, you don't have body language. And there you're figuring out also who those people are through the body language. And this is something we're using absolutely every day. We don't call it body language for nothing. It informs us on who the person are. And this is an element that was happy to see in journalism to some extent. Finally, also, this work is really, for me, about putting you in my shoes. I'm not here to tell you who's wrong or who's right in that conflict. I let you judge. I let you listen to those people. And as a journalist and as a war correspondent, it's something that is really important for me to understand what is really happening on the ground, and not in a technical way not in a factual way, but in a human way, and see what I saw on the ground, meaning there are people on both sides. They're refusing humanity from each other, but we can see they still have this. And so it was extremely interesting when I went to present this in Israel and Palestine. Um, and in Tel Aviv, I would have a crowd of Israeli walking towards their enemy, listening to the enemy, and this is something they could not have done in any other position. And it was striking how they saw the similarities with their own life. I'm going to make this talk shorter than David's, but I, I'm not going to go away without showing you um, a young man, Israeli, who's about to go to the army and who's just out of the enemy. <laughs> זה בעיקר העיף אותי. אז אתה מסתכל על אבו חייל בעיניים, אתה לא יכול באמת להגיד שהאויב שלך. בסך הכל מה הוא עושה? הוא נלחם בשביל החירות שלו כמו, כמו שאתה נלחם בשביל זה. נלחם בשביל החיים שלו ובשביל המשפחה שלו. כאילו זה טיפה יותר גרם לי להבין ש, ש, שהצד השני הוא מתנהל באותה, באותה צורה בדיוק כמונו. זה עוד שנה, לא יודע מה אני אעשה בצבא, אבל בטוח זה יהיה משהו... אי אפשר לדעת כאילו, זה בטוח יהיה משהו כנגד האויב. האויב כביכול, 
כאילו, נלך להילחם נגדו, נגד מי שהסתכלתי לו בעיניים עכשיו. זה נורא מוזר, כי גם, גם כשאתה חייל, אתה לא, 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 לא מקבל את ההזדמנות הזאת לעמוד מול האויב שלך, ולשמוע לא אותו, <laughs> זה בטוח לא מה שאתה מקבל בצבא. אז זה היה מעניין. And to finish a word, warning about technologies, as David says, we've got to be careful because this is life. But with virtual reality, if you can bridge people, you can divide them very easily. In the same way, I could try to put them together. There is many ways to divide people. So we need to be careful about technologies. And for makers, as David says also, for you uh, as makers or as users, to be really mindful and to keep a critical mind as what it is, what it does, where it leads, and thank you very much. Okay, do we have any questions? I can kick off, I can, oh, okay. I was going to pick up, David, on what you were touched on as well, um, and maybe the two of you could start with this one. What is the role of the artist or creator within technology? Well, how to be critical of that technology to start with, to see what we can do with it, to see what are the limits of that technology. But I'm not a technologist at all. I barely can update my iPhone to give you the level. But I need to understand what a technology can do in order to design projects with it. And um, it is really questioning the medium and seeing what kind of stories we can do uh, and try to bridge us more than to divide us with those tools. Yeah, I think uh, I agree with that, of course. And, you know, I'd say the, the role of the artist in, in these kinds of, um, you know, given the context of what we're talking about tonight, I'd say it's probably not unlike the role of, of any artist. I mean, I think anyone working with any tool or any medium, whether, you know, it's a painter or novelist or, or you know, Kareem working with, Uh, his camera or um, virtual reality technology, I think it's to show us something about ourselves um, that maybe we, we didn't realize before or, um, you know, we would, you know, when I was at the film board and even before, uh, point of view was always important. So if, uh, you know, one of the first things that we I would talk about with, with um, whether there was a filmmaker making a linear film or, a maker creating something interactive is, you know, what's your point of view? And uh, often the discussions would revolve around, well, what's point of view or, you know, um, and it's a longer conversation, but I mean, we would distill it to sort of the idea of essentially what do you want to say about the world that we live in and what do you want uh, people to learn about themselves and, and that world? So I think the, the role is irrespective, you know, similar irrespective of technology. But I think the only thing I'd add is that when, you know, when you're using, when you're using tools, especially tools, uh, digital tools, tools that are maybe more part of the, uh, the stack as Benjamin Bratton showed, um, is perhaps you're more, uh, should be more, uh, beholden to perhaps pulling things apart and showing that stack. And. I'd use an example of um, uh, your project, Seven Grams, which, um, you know, if you have an iPhone or an Android device, uh, you should download and try. Uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing project that maybe Kareem will talk about later, but, you know, essentially, I don't know if I'm going to do it justice, but, you know, it breaks, to me, what it does is it breaks down what we hold in our hands, you know, eight hours or more a day, the phone, and it shows all of the different layers of kind of the technocratic, uh, you know, system and, and, and everything that underlies it in terms of economic policies, in terms of resource extraction, 
in terms of uh, invisible workers. And it does that in a narrative in a very powerful one. Um, so that's an example, I think, where an artist is working with technological tools and perhaps um, doing something more um, than uh, perhaps you might do in a painting and doing it in a different way, I guess. Dream, do you want to give us an eye? Are he at seven grams? So I'd, it's true that I disagree too, if you think. No, no, I can't <laughs> agree. I'm like the technocratic take. Um, so Seven Grams is my latest project, and indeed it's available on app stores, just seven grams all in letters. And in 2015, I was in Congo for the enemy, and all of those conflicts, I was photographing the reason why those people are fighting. And in Israel, Palestine, it's obviously not a religious war, it is a land war. In Congo, it's a war for the resources. And in Salvador, it's more of a pity crime racketeering in between gangs that are very, very powerful and disrupting the whole country. And when I was in Congo, I was photographing artillery miners in illegal mites in the Eastern Congo. And it struck me because I photographed them with my iPhone. And while I was photographing them with my iPhone, I realized they were extracting the very mineral that was making my iPhone powerful. And within two meters, everything was there. This was 2015, the idea was planted in my mind. I had not cleared and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, but I thought there is something there. And once I was done with the enemy, I started working on these projects. And basically it's an augmented reality app that's going to tell you, that's going to talk about four different minerals that mostly come from Congo, not exclusively, but often. And um, why do we use those minerals? And, which way are they indispensable in our smartphones? And then slowly by slowly, we'll trickle down to Congo and discover the horrendous condition in which artillery miners are working and understand that they get paid $2 a day. So while it's shiny, beautiful, technologically, extremely powerful, some people are paying the price of a beloved device and I wanted to remind generations that maybe not remind so much generations that because I'm not sure they, they're really aware of that. So I designed really an experience for 17 to 24 years old for the device that they loved the most, that they touched the most every day, but also the device they're discovering the world ways. And I've tried to use the medium as the subject, the protagonist, turn everything upside down, hopefully for informing younger generation that in the future, as they're going to be buying more electronics, as all of us, we should be mindful as what kind of electronics we buy. Does anyone have a question they'd like to add? Hi, um, Thank you. I have a question about human experience when they interact with those technology. Uh, when I use AR or VR or even mixed reality, I feel there are lots of digital information to me. I feel overwhelmed. I feel it's like this society makes us to be more productive and more is more. But just like what you mentioned in mindfulness, sometimes when we consider us as a human, we think less is more, not more is more. So do you think in uh, like technology design or even um, immer uh, immersive technology design, we, uh, there is a way to design those technology, not like to consider more about our experience, not the productive way or, or how uh, quickly they do these tasks. So thank you. Um, I mean, if, if I'm understanding you correctly, you, you can use, uh, for example, a, a phone, uh, for, for, uh, work. It can be, uh, sort of, um, you know, a tool that is, is, is part of a larger system of work and labor. And, you know, you can also use a phone uh, to read a book on, uh, with a VR headset, you can you know, it, it will become a tool of productivity more so uh, than 
um, our 2D screens, laptops, will be in VR headsets or something like that more uh, to work. Um, but, uh, you know, so, so I think it's sort of inevitable that tools uh, that we associate with one thing like productivity um, it can also be used as tools for art making, I guess. So, you know, I think um, what I said earlier uh, in the, in, or towards the end of my talk, the idea of getting those tools into the hands of artists, I think we, we, is important in the sense that we, we can start to use that to, those tools for art making. Um, you know, there's, there's always the systems in which we work that make, um, creating those experiences or getting them out to a public, uh, sometimes more challenging. Uh, but yeah, I think getting those tools into the hands of more artists, some of which are in the room. And, and we talked about that during the, the weekend frame doc workshop is important. Um, I'd say the last thing is that often with VR, especially, uh, with any technology, we, we kind of take the patterns from the previous technology and we bring them forward. We remediate them. So a lot of VR, I, I agree with you, is really kind of heavy on visual, uh, on text, on information. And I hope I'm getting your question right, but my sense is that's part of the problem and part of what maybe your experience has been. It prioritizes the visual um, and uh, it, it, it probably doesn't, uh, it does too much remediation at this point. It borrows too much from previous technologies. So I guess I just, I say that we need to experiment more and bring other senses into VR, uh, bring uh, different ways of moving, uh, using our bodies differently um, and, and sort of realizing it's not a computer screen or a phone strapped to our face. It's, it's meant for other things. And artists are great at doing that. I'm having, I'm having a problem tonight with microphones. <laughs> Thank you so much for your talks. Um, in thinking about the topic in readiness for tonight, it, you know, can technology make us human? I was thinking about the tu the Turing test. You know, the, the Turing test where the idea is that you have uh, a machine and a human behind a screen and there's a conversation going on and the person doing the test is saying, oh no, that's actually two humans or no, there's a machine in there. And the idea is to pick out the machine that's faking it. And it's almost like the the burden of proof has been changed now that we have to prove that we're not machines, you know, uh, because chatbot can do G uh, essays and, um, you know, there's so many things now that we thought were deeply human that now can be imitated so effectively that it's almost not the imitation game anymore. It's almost like the originality game. You've got to actually, we're still human. We still do this and you can't do that yet. So I guess my question is, is there a role in there like for creatives to move beyond, to, to continue to sort of assert the human, I guess? Oh, <laughs> yes, of course there is a role and we're going to have to stay awake and make sure, but I think we're really getting to a point where, as I said, it's going to be become harder and harder to distinguish what has been created by AI and what has been created by a human being. I don't know. I'm not a futurist. I'm not a technologist. I don't know what this is going to bring as a set of problems and ethical questions and moral questions, but we're definitely entering a new age and, um, and I hope philosopher, I hope technologists and futurists. We really look at this and try to find solutions. I'm feeling very poorly equipped to bring more to that conversation on that subject because it's really, we just have the start of it and I've just started experimenting, I think like most people here, um, since the start of the year. So those things are, are coming so fast to us. And that may be one of the problem of technologies they're coming so fast and we don't have the time to really assess the good and, and and set some ethical standards around what we do uh, with this. 
we've seen not to again speak about social network, but we've seen that it was more disruptive to the public health than it is, especially for youth, uh, with social networks than it is positive. So yes, we have the promises to go and be in touch with everyone in the world, but at the same time, if it's at the expense of our well-being, um, I'm not sure those technologies uh, will survive very long, or at least I hope they're going to be remediated in a way that they do more good than the harm they are producing today. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, you know, anything that challenges human exceptionalism is I'm a fan of, you know, so I think, I think we need more of that. So, you know, it's, I, I, I'm being a bit glib, but I think that, you know, the more we, uh, learn about the world, the more, the world that we are creating and, and, you know, that it, whether it's about, you know, whale communication and the complexities, the, the more we realize that the, the, you know, the world doesn't care about us, uh, and, and that we're not exceptional and, and, you know, I think the better, you know, if there's, there's, uh, a, a lot, we don't have the language yet, I think, to sort of, um, like in what, in what Kareem says, I think I agree with technology proceeds at a pace where I think you know, what we mean when we say creativity, uh, sentience, uh, you know, and use all those words, I think, I think we're going to have to spend more time figuring out what that means, but I actually hope it leads more towards realizing that we're not exceptional, um, than, than trying to fight for, for, for our place apart from the world. Hi, thanks so much for your talk, um, Kareem and David. Um, I was just thinking you were talking, there's a really lovely um, definition of technology that Ursula Le Guin offered off, which was that um, she said she felt that technology was the active human interface, um, or the active interface between humans and the material world. And then goes on to talk about how technology is many things, but was really critical of the society she was operating in that really privileged high technologies over supposed low technologies. So pointing out that paper, paints, linen are tech in the same way that, or in slightly different ways, but equally in as valid way as a VR headset or a supercomputer or that kind of thing. Um, and I was just wondering for you as artists, as makers who are very, you know, mindful of the stack and mindful of the social and ecological implications of a lot of the technologies or the high tech that we use. I was wondering what keeps you in the space working with high technologies or advanced technologies um, and whether you would ever consider working with lower tech as well. Um, I am not medium centric anymore. I used to be because I was a photographer. Um, but really this latest project, Seven Grams, um, I was thinking about my audiences first. Thinking about this problem of artists and miners in Eastern Congo, probably most people don't want to hear about. Um, I was trying to identify an audience that could have an impact. I could do something about it. Even a little thing. When the little many things become something bigger. And so for me, it's um, foremost choosing a subject, it's often with social justice in my case, um, and then identifying an audience that can do something about it and only the media comes after. So perhaps next time will be paper and group scissors. Um, I don't know yet, but just to say that, uh, technology comes last in my case and, uh, we'll see what comes up. Yeah. I, I, th I think what keeps me working with emerging technologies or tech, uh, it's, it's actually I think what I've come to realize it's less, what, what motivated me was less about the fact that they were emerging, although that's kind of fun because you're trying to create a language, you know, with, with that medium. But I think what got me into it in the first place, uh, was basically anything that allowed, um, me and the teams that I was working with to create a world in which, uh, the audience was 
given some agency and that, that the relationship that whatever that technology was uh, could, could have in flipping that role. I mean, I love film and I worked in film and television uh, for a number of years, but I, I think what I was always drawn to was anything low tech or high tech that could, could involve the, the audience in a way that, that gave them some agency. I think I just found that I, I was interested in what that could enable. So I think that's what keeps me in the space. And then as far as VR, I mean, I, 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 I do think it may sign, it may kind of come across as hyperbolic, but I think that I, you know, it, it's a bit like being around when film was, um, you know, a, a newish medium. And I think that's what, what keeps me around. Also, you know, when you look at Jerome Lanier's two definitions that I mentioned, I think it's wanting to have some role in, you know, skewing the, the, uh, the access towards a medium that, you know, shows us something about ourselves versus that evil Skinner box that it could be. So I think that's what keeps me in working with these specific tools. Any other questions? And I haven't brought my watch up here, so I haven't looked at the time. It's quite a two. All right. Um, you've sort of alluded to this, but um, I guess thinking about the conversation since since the invention of printing press, people have always panicked about the implications of technology. So do we think that the current moral panic about AI, social media, deep fakes is just the latest iteration of this? I would just, I would just say that after the printing press, we went for 300 years of wars. So it's probably justified. <laughs> For once we remember and when a new technology comes, problem comes too, um, but it goes too fast today. For, for when it comes to AI, I would love to lift my hands, but I don't feel qualified at all. I mean, I think often the moral panic is about the wrong thing. I, you know, I think we, you know, um, and we underestimate, you know, some things and we overestimate others, but I, I think often it's, you know, the moral panic misses the people who are usually missed about in terms of who benefits and who doesn't from new technology. So, um, those who are often, you know, uh, the loudest in the room, as far as, you know, moral panic goes with technology often, are, you know, are, are not paying attention to, uh, you know, people who are on the, the, the fringes who, who are you know, not benefiting or being harmed by our existing world. Um, I guess also for me, I mean, uh, you know, I think I'm a bit ambivalent right now about the moral panic about AI because I think the moral panic about uh, the natural world and, and, and what we're doing to it is is perhaps greater. And I, I understand that AI is sort of enmeshed in all of that. It, you, you can't separate it, but you know, I, I do think that um, maybe, so, you know, sometimes we, the shiny object is is a problem. At the same time, it, it, it will be fundamentally, you know, impacting, but we'll get it wrong in terms of what, you know, what what it does and, and, and how it impacts and who it impacts. Okay. Well, I think if we've got no more questions, I'd like to extend a... Fantastic. Congratulations and thank you to David and Karim.